Hey guys, I thought I'd make a little video about a, a story that's been sitting in my files now for almost 10 years. Uh, it, I stumbled on it back in 2009 when I was doing research for a motorsport book called Speed Duel, the inside story of the land speed record in the 60s. I was going through newspapers from October 1965 and I stumbled on this story about a bank robbery that took place in Syracuse, New York. Uh, the Brinks warehouse was robbed. Now the interesting thing about this robbery was that the thieves got into the vault using a cannon. They blasted a hole through the wall using an anti-tank gun firing 20 millimeter shells that were recovered at the scene. And when I read that right away, I thought, holy shit, that's the storyline for Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, the movie. Now, if you're a, if you're a Clint Eastwood fan, you're going to know Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Uh, it was uh, a movie made 1974. It was written by Michael Cimino, and it was directed by Michael Cimino. It was a, the Cimino's first movie that he directed. He would go on to make The Deer Hunter and other movies. Um, in the in the in the story. Clint Eastwood plays a bank robber called the Thunderbolt, and Jeff Bridges is his sidekick, Lightfoot. And they set out to rob a bank using a cannon to blast a hole through into the vault. Uh, so um, I'm thinking, man, this uh, Brinks robbery, that's what, that's what inspired Chimino to write the story. I, I went, right away went on the internet just to check this out, just to confirm that I that my discovery was correct uh, and I couldn't find any indication that uh, Chimino had been inspired by this true story but I very much suspect that he probably uh, was and that the that this was kind of the, the the seed that from from which Thunderbolt and Lightfoot grew anyway uh, here is a little rundown of that robbery that took place um, at the Brinks Warehouse in Syracuse. It was the weekend of October 23, 24, 1965. Uh, and uh, the, the, the robbers, they jimmied open the garage door of the Brinks Warehouse and they drove a vehicle into the building. Then they unloaded this uh, anti-tank cannon and they covered it with old mattresses and blankets and they put a homemade silencer on the barrel then they fired more than 30 rounds into the wall of the vault. Uh, it was like a foot thick with a rebar in it. But they, using these armor-piercing rounds, they were able to blast a hole right into it, get into the vault, and they made off with about $425,000 in cash and checks and coin and whatnot. And amazingly, this is Syracuse, New York, nobody heard a thing. <laughs> The cops recovered some clues at the scene, of course. There were all these 20 millimeter uh, cannon shells that had been fired into the wall. There were also some tools that had made in Canada stamped on them. So the cops figured that there was a Canadian connection and they started checking that out. And that's where the whole caper fell to pieces. So here's how it went down after they, they pieced together the plot of what happened. It started with this young guy up in Montreal, Quebec, 22-year-old uh, Joel Singer, who was an associate with the so-called West End Gang. Uh, now, this guy Joel, he set this thing up with his uncle. Uh, his name was Jack Frank, who lived in Long Island, New York. Well, so what Singer did was he gave his uncle Jack some money to buy a couple of uh, Finnish-made anti-tank guns. Uncle Frank, he goes and he buys these guns from a dealer in Virginia, and he has them delivered up to Canada. But then, while they're still in the delivery warehouse in Plattsburgh, New York, a young singer, he breaks into the warehouse and he steals the anti-tank guns before they cross the border. He figures that if he doesn't sign for the guns, uh, if they just get stolen... The, the cops will, won't trace them to him. <laughs> well, he figured wrong. Um, these two anti-tank cannons getting ordered and shipped up north, uh, that threw up a red flag with the FBI. And pretty soon uh, they 
they got in touch with old Uncle Jack. Uh, they paid Uncle Jack a visit in Long Island, and he uh, squealed like a stuck pig. He spilled the beans uh, and gave up his nephew, Joel. And Joel ends up on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Uncle Jack also gave up the gun, uh, which they had dumped in the water off Long Island. Uh, the cops were able to fish it out of the water. So uh, anyway, uh, Joel Singer's on the FBI 10 most wanted list. He gets arrested in Montreal about a month later in December 1965, and he's extradited to the U.S. to stand trial. Um, he was a tough guy, I guess. He refused to give up any of his accomplices, so he went down for the robbery on his own, no leniency, with Uncle Jack testifying against him. Singer was uh, sentenced to Attica State Prison for five to seven years of, quote, hard labor, which was still a thing back then, I guess. Um, now, at this point, I, I had read some of these articles, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is, a, this is an interesting story. Uh, man, this Joel Singer guy, uh, he was only 22 then. He's probably still alive. Wouldn't that be neat to track him down and maybe, you know, f hear, hear his story? It might make an interesting book. But alas, uh, it did not have a happy ending. Um, Singer was in Attica in 1970, no, 1971 during the Attica riots when 43 prisoners were killed. Uh, and this apparently left him traumatized. Uh, and he spent the last months of his sentence at Attica in the prison's psychiatric unit. Uh, he was paroled in 1972, but it was on condition that he uh, get, go into a psychiatric treatment center, um, which he did. But after he was released uh, in the following year, he committed suicide at the age of 31. So that was the end of Joel Singer, uh, and nobody else was associated with the crime. So that was the end of the story. Anyway, I thought I'd just make this little video to uh, give you this little cinema footnote about a Clint Eastwood movie that maybe you've seen, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel.